Okay, well, let's kick off anyway. I think we've uh, got most people. Thanks for joining us. Um, good to see you all again. Uh, the purpose of this, as we said, is is at the front end of this um, CR22 impact assessment window. We wanted to give everybody the opportunity to pitch up and ask questions that might be starting to surface as you work your way through the change requests. Um, it won't be the only way in which you can contact us, but it's probably the easiest way and the best way to begin with. Um, so uh, for uh, this session, we, we will go through a few slides. Uh, apologies, we do need to set the context, uh, but primarily we want more than half the time to be Q&A. Uh, so I've got the, most of my team here to answer questions uh, that probably are more detailed than, than I'll be able to answer myself. But the important thing is to, to give you an opportunity to, to raise some questions. Uh, this isn't obviously replacing working group conversations, but it might help you know, bring things together in the context of the plan and the impact assessment work that you're doing. So uh, we will crack on and uh, if you could reserve your questions until after I've got through the slides, that'd be helpful. And at that point, we'll do a hands up exercise first come first served as usual. So for the uh, change request 22, uh, for which the impact assessment window started on, uh, uh, what was, it was the Friday, um, it was, uh, it was sorry, it was the day after PSG, the 6th of August, and it goes until and including the 26th, sorry, of April. Of April, right. So, the uh, the CR22. Uh, just to summarise, uh, and for some of you who were at PSG, you would have heard some of this before. But uh, for others, it probably be worth me just uh, covering this one specifically. Um, since the um, design decision document in August 21, there have been quite a lot of changes, and we know that the uh, transition timetable is is not credible. And and we've been working with it for far too long, and it's not really anywhere near in line what's a credible and realistic plan. So uh, the intention for this replan is to get to a point where we actually do have a baseline programme plan that industry buy into. Um, there are a number of big changes that have happened in all of this time. Obviously, the ability for participants to proceed at the pace of their choosing. In other words, the earliest not held back, but there are options, which is a, quite a big change and phasing of the plan clearly is a big change because it impacts the, the way in which everybody will a resource and deliver uh, the, the, the program. Uh, from a sit strategy point of view, there have been uh, quite significant decisions even more recently to preserve M9 and to get the program moves, moving on a phased basis and allowing for staggering of, of entry into CIT um, and most notably NPRS, which was one of the outliers when we uh, initiated round three. So those changes are quite significant. There are changes around uh, equivalence, of course, so participants um, in SIT will not have to undertake uh, qualification testing, although they'll still have to do their qualification assessment document and any DBT2 uh, for systems and process changes that won't be tested in SIT or qualification testing. So that equivalence is, is still settling, but that's the strong assumption and that's what that's our intent. So your impact assessments would be on that basis based on that assumption. Um, and uh, you know, from, from our, our perspective, uh, the uh, placing alliance is another element where non-SIT uh, participants may, where appropriate, place reliance on on MHHS testing done er done earlier by other participants, and that policy is going through TMAG on the 19th, I think, um, and subsequently we'll get to the uh, code delivery bodies um, PABs as well. Uh, but it's important uh, we recognise to to have got more certainty on that subject, and I'm sure it will be coming up in the Q and A. Later, um, on qualification in the in the plan, uh, so that that's something that's changed since the original timetable. We we now have seven tranches for um, qualification, uh, accepting LD, LDSOs who will carry out their qualification testing earlier. Um, but basically, seven tranches, um, and then migration itself is again phased, and, and we'll start with participants who complete SIT, and thereafter migration will mirror the phase nature of the qualification uh, delivery. Uh, and finally, and, and, and certainly not least, the decision on reverse migration that happened uh, during the uh, November and December uh, period um, has had impact on everybody, but it has allowed for the phase nature of the plan itself. Um, and it allows SIT and qualification to run over an extended period without prejudicing a consumer choice, which was the, the tricky balance that we had to achieve uh, when developing this plan. Uh, previously. 
Um, so on round three itself, we we got a good response rate, good, good insights. It has provided the basis for um, this final uh, proposed plan with a few variations, but it's good that um, you know, the intention is to have a plan that industry buys into. Um, and and that, that was the kind of nature of the program that we set out originally. Uh, but we did say in January, February, March this year that whilst we had a round three timeline, we would be guided by uh, working groups, by advisory groups about consensus across SMEs um, to ensure that the plan is uh, reinforcing and aligned with conversations that either have happened now through those governance bodies or are still going, uh, but where uncertainty has become reduced. Uh, and certainly we, we wanted the, the plan to be led by those conversations and any remaining uncertainties or gaps at this stage are just by the nature of the majority of the conversations through governance at, the po at this point. The plan itself obviously is, is fundamentally predicated on getting an MVC, getting the minimum and the right mix of participants to conduct SIT, uh, but we do believe we'll achieve that based on engagement and feedback we've had so far. So this plan is live, but it will be subject to control change as we drive to manage delivery risks as we go forward, that's normal. Uh, there may be CRs against the plan after it's been approved, potentially sooner rather than later. That is just a fact of life. Um, so we, we acknowledge also risk in the plan and we put date ranges in at key points, key milestones in the plan to uh, to represent where we know there is more risk and more uncertainty at this point. Um, and as you can imagine, we're trying to balance the uh, the demands of, um, of, of industry in having a realistic plan with something which is expedited per Ofgem's uh, consistent messaging on this on this point that we need to do this as soon as we can, and therefore we we've tried to provide a balanced plan that uh, fulfills each of those objectives as well as we can. We'll move on to the next slide. Um, briefly, you'll have seen this now, uh, but the next slide is just to show the way in which the plan has progressed uh, since CR9 through round three to where we are now. Um, sorry for the background noise. I think I've got a hailstorm going on in the background. Um, so basically our, our plan is larger than that we showed in round three. There's some date ranges around M10, a three month window there. Uh, we are planning to be M10 as it stands, but recognising that it might move somewhere between there at a point three months later. We've made the assumption in the plan that if M10 were to move by a certain amount, then the other key milestones like M14 and M16 would move by the same amount. Um, in reality, if M10 moves, it maybe we can lessen the effect further down, but for the purposes of the plan and the impact assessments, one should assume that that's the way it will work. Um, so that's basically the way the, program, uh, the plan has progressed. Um, at the top top part of this, we have um, we have uh, extended component integration testing by a couple of weeks to accommodate <coughs> important drops of NPRS. Uh, some components are, are iteratively developing and um, releasing the updates to NPRS. So there will be some significant drops uh, going into that slightly later start for CIT. Um, and um, we also ensuring that the end of CIT aligns with uh, some other material drops from some claimants of NPRS. So NPRS bookends the CIT um, and some changes therefore have been made uh, to timelines around that. We've also uh, made some assumptions about the period for regression testing. No, nobody can absolutely be sure about this at the moment, but in order to keep the duration of SIT the same and not to affect the later milestones, we have reduced to a certain degree the duration that we have for regression testing, but that is represented as a risk in the planning documents. <clears throat> Moving on to the next slide. Uh, so this is uh, essentially, as I say, a refresh of, of the round three plan with the critical path shown through it. The main one being uh, the plan all the way through term 16 based on the time scale taken to get through the last tranche of qualification. There are a couple of other um, uh, for illustration, other critical paths in here. One is through the MVC, through SIP to migration, reaching M10, 11, and also one that goes through the first qualification tranche through to migration. We pointed out key risks here and we've tried to provide the kind of material risks to the plan. Obviously, risk one is about core capability providers being being there on time. Um, composition of the MVC in risk two is one that we well know. Um, and uh, as, as you know, we've given more time um, 
to identify the uh, SIT community. Uh, so we moved the date from the 21st of April to the 23rd of May uh, to draw a line under what we believe will be the, uh, the SIT community moving forward. <clears throat> There's the risk around uh, data. Uh, so risk three around test data readiness. Uh, we re recognise that we need to do better and we need to uh, be quicker in, in articulating the approach to test data. That is improving now. We are recovering the information. There will be um, uh, artefacts coming out. An initial approach and plan for that was aired at the SIT working group last week and will be followed up at the data working group later this month. So, and, and it includes this approach, test data, data readiness approach. We've included a, a, a movement of the, the date for which data extracts will be taken from June to August, as you may be aware, which has given a bit more time for this exercise as well. Our risk for is, is just around the sensitive plan to the dates for SIT functional um, and SIT migration testing, um, particularly with migration testing. There is definitely some timeline risk relating to the impact of the uh, migration approach and, and migration design and any decisions relating to that, um, and notably on NPRS, and we're watching that one carefully. Uh, risk five, um, change in, in round three. So the same thing as round three, all, DS, all the LDSOs need to qualify by M10 to ensure national coverage. And so we get set out the timeline separately because they will go through qualification activities more um, uh, earlier um, than, than uh, tranche one in qualification. A drop, dropping around a bit, risk nine, uh, there are assumptions for qualification testing for each of the tranches. These have been agreed with the code delivery bodies. So we've got six months for qualification activities plus two months for governance, which includes PAB, environment updates, and moving from staging into production. <clears throat> we do think in risk seven, there's a risk that we may get some bunching towards the end of qualification. We may get a lot of slower participants getting in the later tranches, uh, which may create some bottlenecks, uh, and then we'll need to monitor that risk carefully. Um, risk six is about suppliers contracted parties, um, particularly if some of them are not going through SIT um, because those suppliers will need those parties to qualify for the supplier to fully get into migration is something we've discussed before. Um, and obviously for those uh, suppliers who are in SIT, we'll be interested to know what your kind of uh, mini ecosystem is to get through SIT and be ready to do some migration soon afterwards. Uh, so that's an important risk to, to note. Um, and obviously risk eight uh, relating to suppliers with larger volumes. So it's relevant for this group particularly. Um, you know, we should be expecting uh, large suppliers to uh, seek to start migration sooner rather than later, given the, the window and the constraints that are in the plan at this stage. And, and uh, to that point in risk 10, uh, we, we've basically modelled scenarios and made assumptions, including assumptions based on previous programmes like FSP, um, which show that we need to allow 18 months to affect migration. We're assuming, we're assuming at this point that we'll have a couple of large suppliers in SIT uh, to be validated, which would be, you know, five to 10 million M pounds available to be migrated from April 25, <clears throat> possibly 12 months to get that done. It probably means another 20 odd million to be migrated after qualification uh, with that qualification conducted by the seven tranches and the first tr qualification tranche would start migrating in September 25 uh, and again with 12 months to complete that. So the last people to get through qualification would do so by the end of March 26 and then we assume six months for them to complete that. So we end up uh, at the end of Q3 26 or early Q4 and that obviously M15 is where 100% of my uh, M pounds need to be uh, migrated. So um, that's the kind of helicopter view on the plan. If we then move on by phase and I'll, I'll very briefly touch on some points from the phases because uh, I'm sure some of this will be fairly, fairly familiar to you and you'll be reading documents anyway. So we have put in a new approach to design assurance which has been communicated via a DAG and, and a specific webinar last month. Um, it is important to engage uh, participants, especially those in, who are going to go into SIT, to engage them as early as possible to gauge any areas of concern around design and target those more deeply and support them more deeply. Um, so our initial questions uh, and questionnaire has gone out now to the core capability providers and will go out to everybody else on the 9th of May. Um, but basically we are focused on the designs and any related dependencies. And obviously one of the benefits of volunteering for SIT 
is that we'll put more focus on design assurance, uh, the design assurance being support for for you through your design, ensuring that we work with you to uh, resolve any issues or uncertainties around the design and enable you to get through your DBT um, and, and reach PIT and then into SIT. So we do see design assurance as uh, the priority that we're going to put on design assurance for SIT participants as being a benefit to those SIT participants. And we've tried to simplify the approach. Uh, and to the next slide, um, I think it's basically just backing up uh, the timelines. So you'll see your questionnaires on the 9th of May. For those who want to go into SIT or intend to, then we do expect the questionnaire to be responded to in the timeline are given. For those that don't, we would still appreciate responses at this point, uh, but it's not mandatory for those parties and, and we will follow it up later in the year. Moving on. So DBT 1 and 2 need to be understood. We, we hope and, and think that we have clarified that uh, as we've gone through uh, both round three and working groups. So design uh, DBT1 is DBT activities required to enter into either SIT or qualification testing, uh, depending on the path you choose to take. Um, and this is a programme requirement and will be designed and test assured, assured by the programme, whereas uh, with DBT2, those system process changes delivered by participants that will not be tested in SIT or qualification testing, but are needed for MHHS, such as consequential change. It's an obligation of all parties to do this, uh, SIT and non-SIT, uh, and those activities will be assured by the code delivery bodies via the qualification activities. Quickly moving on, I've covered this probably, that we've now got more clarity around the uh, test approach and plan. The overarching test approach and plan is, is an artefact that will come out next month, uh, but the timeline essentially uh, sh shows that uh, our intention is now to take uh, for data cuts in the 24th of August, as opposed to the end of June, which was in the round three plan. Okay, moving on. I'm being driven by the navigator on this slide back now to keep up. Right, uh, so SIT, I, I think everybody's familiar with this, um, particularly in respect of the uh, minimum viable cohort. And I've also pointed out that there's a bit more time for us to uh, draw a line under the SIT community. We want to get the placing reliance policy done we want participants to make proposals for how they will get through SIT um, and those conversations uh, should be starting already. Um, and then by the 23rd of May, we'll draw a line under that and we'll, just, uh, we'll be clear about who we expect to see in SIT from that point onwards. And I'm, I'm sure that will come up in the community later. Right, moving on. Um, nothing much to say. Obviously, the objective of SIT uh, for the programme is to is to uh, test and prove the design, the end-to-end -end design, um, and obviously uh, the uh, to execute the scenarios to uh, verify the the characteristics of the market interface and services. Um, again, we uh, want to point out at the bottom of the slide uh, the SIT participants are not expected to undergo additional qualification testing in the qualification phase. That is a strong assumption. Uh, and we see, see no reason as to why that wouldn't be the case. And the programme is very much aligned with the code delivery bodies on this point at this stage. Moving on. We've exploded out the uh, SIP plan because it will be of interest. Um, and, and it's important to note that this doesn't include uh, the impact of any uncertainties around D170 or impact of CR17 and CR18. We know that there are risks and potential changes that could impact the plan. Um, but obviously, if those changes happen, they'll go through a controlled uh, change process. Um, and as I said earlier, there's there's always the possibility the plan may uh, may have change requests applied to it uh, after it's been baselined. The the SIT functional and SIT migration testing uh, streams converge at the core systems code freeze. So obviously, if there's any significant slippage in either SIT functional or SIT migration testing, that would hit the critical path uh, and, and the end of SIT and therefore impact on later milestones. So it's just something to point out explicitly as a risk uh, to the timeline. OK, moving on. Qualification, uh, which of course the ownership of this is with the uh, code delivery bodies. Um, but again, um, I would just say that the code delivery bodies, uh, as well as owning it, therefore will be managing and controlling the entry and exit from qualification through the tranches 
um, they have to be uh, very fair and reasonable in terms of determining who goes through which tranche. Uh, but this is for the code delivery bodies to own and the programme will be supporting. And there are clear uh, uh, roles and responsibilities between us in, in respect of that. And the, as you know, the draft uh, qualification approach and plan has been out for a while now uh, and should be. Uh, I think I've got some participation. Right, moving on, code drafting. Um, just obviously uh, M, M8 needs to happen by or before M10 to support the, the M10 milestone. Um, and uh, we have, I don't think there's been significant changes to the to the approach, um, but this really identifies the, the approach assumed for uh, code drafting going forward. Um, and there's a plan, I think, on the next page, which uh, those of you are interested in this will be familiar with. Migration and transition. Uh, so the, the migration and transition work stream is going to provide all the activities and deliverables required to prepare for and execute MPAM migration from M11 to M15, followed by cutover to the new arrangements at M16. Uh, we've included uh, clear, clear definitions of the terms migration and transition because uh, I think most of us sometimes get hooked up on uh, on these terms uh, and for the purposes of the plan and the impact assessment uh, use these definitions of migration and transition uh, to ensure that you do have the right understanding um, and obviously associated planned deliverables um, that are associated here and are also in the plan and uh, articulated in terms of the dates that are expected to be delivered. Um, have we got something else? I think we've got something on transition uh, design approach as well, um, which I, I won't won't talk about specifically, but of course this is to do with you know, the legacy and, and the MHHS process coexisting through the migration period and how that will work for the design for that, those arrangements that need to be completed. So that's quite a key topic at the moment and uh, obviously will be an area of uncertainty until it's uh, progressed further. So that's this is these are the phases that are much further out, of course. Um, so we put more focus into the the shorter uh, the shorter timelines. So. I'm going to stop here because I'm keen that we have more than half the time for Q&A. I'm sure there will be quite a few, and I see that uh, Lee has, has elbowed his way at the front of the queue, uh, <laughs> as usual. So uh, over to Q&A, and, and Lee is first in the queue. All right, um, we'll look forward to have, uh, have the point of rebaseline the plan, which needed. Um, the, the three months ranges against some of the T1 milestones. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that you're going to be still planning to be at the beginning of those that three months range? Yeah, yes, the planning assumption is the is the first of the, mar the two milestones. We call the first one a planning milestone, the second one a contingency milestone. It could be anywhere between, but we'll do the usual approach uh, as we kind of pursued in faster switching, which is at every control point, we'll review the window okay. with the intention of can we reduce the window based on what we know. And there's a milestone in advance of the window where a decision is made about the date itself. So it's the same approach that those of you who are on faster switching would be familiar with. I, I wasn't, but so should be planning on the basis of the beginning of that three month window. Uh, and Absolutely. If risks materialise, then we'll be we'll we'll, we'll be aware yeah. of that. Right away. What what informed the three months range though? Is that is that just a, a governance thing? Because anything more than that would need offshore approval, or was there no, something? No, no, it, it was based on feedback we got in round three and our view of the risk. Okay. So we had a range of uh, views on on this uh, and of course we didn't take every single outlier earliest and latest but we took the, the majority view okay um and obviously we've taken on uh, comments from working groups and so on as well so it's the uh, it's a pragmatic bottom-up kind of uh, view of the of the of the timing it's not a contrived one okay that's reassuring cheers yeah. thanks chris okay uh a couple of questions um in terms of the um anything that happens between now and the end of the CR process in terms of whether there'll be any movement in the plan, how how will that be validated? I don't understand how that process might work. We can't put a CR on top of a CR, right? So I just want to try and understand <laughs> yeah. how if, if there is any movement through SIT working group or any of the other working groups, how that will be dealt with during the period that this is going through the CR process? 
Yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a good question. Of course, that we've got we've got one Microsoft project plan that underpins all this that start well, this is from now until forever. So the interim plan that is being tracked at PSG is is part of the that it's based on the same document basically. So there are dates in the in the Microsoft project plan which are, are before um, the June when we expect the plan to be approved, and therefore we are we are reporting uh, that interim plan and any changes to that interim plan to PSG every month in, in the dashboard. So um, if if there are potential changes in the working group, they'll go to the advisory group uh, and potentially if they impact the plan, we'll have to get escalated through governance to PSG. Um, so that, that would be the way in which it would be done. So if there are going to be specific changes, well, it's unlikely given the, the shortness of the uh, of the impact assessment window that it's going to really bother you while you're doing your impact assessments on CR22. But there is theoretically anyway, based on impact assessment feedback from participants, the opportunity to uh, to revise or flex the plan slightly. So if, when we come to PSG in in um, in May, uh, if we feel that there are necessary changes to call out since we issued the CR, then we should come to PSG and point those out at that point and and give guidance as to what assumptions participants should make in terms of executing the, the plan that we have. Because yeah. we all know we're not working to the original uh, transition timetable, we are working to the interim plan. And it, it's any changes that might happen that affect either the interim plan or the further out plan, they have to come back to the May PSG as context for any decision that's made to recommend the plan to Ofgem. Okay. I mean, I'm, I, like for context, I'm specifically thinking about the, the phasing of sit and pit etc that might change between now and then um through conversations that are happening I, yes I, I i guess i would venture to suggest that if there are any changes to them they're changes that you as participants have been asking for and would be satisfied with us making and and therefore uh, what we would ex be expecting is any plan that goes to off gem uh would, would point out potential changes which a phd people could say if they agree with or not but uh, mm -hmm. we can we would expect so if there's more for example more phasing or staggering of certain things that would help participants for example to get into sit and they are agreed or they're being agreed or they're intended to be agreed through governance you would want the re baseline plan to represent those those points yeah. and, and therefore you know we would be saying to PSG in May um, they weren't in the plan when we issued it for CR22 but we intend them to be in there what do you think about that? Uh, and PSG, you know, collectively take responsibility for saying we're happy if you make those changes. Yeah. Okay. Um. Sorry. And, and second question, you might take this one offline, but you, you talked about the design assurance questionnaire that came out for central parties day before yesterday. I think. Um. Do you know whether that questionnaire is the same questionnaire that we will have to fill in as a large supplier, or will that change? Bye, sir. Uh, yeah, go on, Paul. Sorry, I've got this camera and no. uh, it will be a questionnaire. Sorry, Sorry I missed that. You, you just can't. It, it, be, it will be the same questionnaire, the same questions. Okay. Yeah, same ones. Okay. Thank you, Paul. I know you've been having some technology problems. Okay. Uh, next question, Naomi. Hi. Hi, thanks. I guess just to follow up on um, Chris's at Paul, is it possible to have, if it's the same questionnaire, is it possible to have a, a early sight of it or is is that not, would that be appropriate? This is your moment where it's gone, that yeah. your text not working. Yeah. No, 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 no. I'm just, uh, I'm just thinking. Uh, I've posted, I've got no I've got no issue sending sending it out. Uh, it will be uh, I'm just trying to think how we are available uh, to parties. It's it's on the configuration uh, of now, Paul, I think I spotted it yesterday. That's right. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yes, it is absolutely right. Yeah, sorry, we gave an Excel. It was the Excel version I'm thinking of. Uh, so yeah. the Excel version is 
is there. So oh, it's on yeah, collaboration it's We'll have a look. Um, Thank you. It, it, it's relevant yeah. to, to some of our, our discussions around around SIT and some of our architecture and um, certainly our back office. Uh, I think we had a, a bilateral this morning where um that that was particularly we would it always worried to point to that design assurance so thank you for that um i, I guess i had a very similar question also to um chris around potential risks that might give rise to, to crs keith yeah. so I, I guess just to check my understanding then as soon if if we're aware of those prior to it going to psg they'll be presented you know, with a, a forward look as part of that PSG decision. Um, I guess if they come after that's been baselined, then then so so be it. But do you have a? Um, I mean, slide fourteen points to to, to CRs that um, be required soon after sort of baselining uh, to address unknown risks. So, do you have a view of which of the risks might result in the CRs at the moment? What might result in the CR? Or, or is that not not available? No, it was a generic point, but obviously we, okay. we, we, we hope that we've done such a great job on the plan that we won't need CRs no, anytime. I yeah. But but I, I, I think I was just being realistic and saying, you know, whilst we might have been suggesting that that's our aspiration in, in the real world, that isn't necessarily going to be happen. I wouldn't want Ofgen to think that they were approving a rebase line and be surprised if a CR came up soon after, Yeah. Um, based on the fact that there's a known there's a known potential change or in-flight change conversation being going on that, that could affect the plan. I think in, in May, we can only be transparent, entirely transparent about what the plan is, the feedback we've got. And if we think that there are, are any changes that either are likely to happen or may happen um, from that point onwards. But I, I think the, the problem is always going to be that we just need to get a plan in place and we, we what we don't want is, is to delay any longer so it's just yeah and fully uh, please, please don't take this as as any um having a different different slap view fully you know just as lee echoed fully supportive of the the need for a plan and and just as chris uh articulated we're particularly looking at that um you know that period between now and, and sit and, and trying to understand our pacing and, and anything that could kind of throw that off course so we're, we'll wait for for if there is going to be any further updates but that's helpful clarity thank you yeah i, I think when, when we do the may psg we'll have the webinar in advance i'm sure that graham will pick up comments or concerns from yeah. the constituency and and you know we'll have a proper conversation at psg about what it is we're approving and what it is not um what i don't want is not to have the expectations managed about what it is that we're signing off and rebaselining um, so yeah, as long as we're all on the same pages and there's a lot of pages, um, then then I'll be happy. But yeah, I I, I think as, as delivery people, we understand uh, that it's going to be a moving feast, and plans always are. Thanks, Keith. Thank you, Naomi. Um, Stephen. Hi, Keith. Thanks. Uh, you you mentioned earlier that if if there is a delay to M um, ten, the current working assumption is though there'll, there'll be a and um, corresponding delay to subsequent milestones. Um, does that include the start of migration for non-SIT participants? Um, I, I was talking to... Uh, so at what point in the plan are you talking about? Sorry, I'm, so I'm, re I'm really talking about, you know, so the, the, the start of migrations for the participants who go through the qualification route. Right. OK, um, the, if we follow the critical path, Stephen, the the start of qualification is driven from um, the end of SIT functional testing, because that's when we have the stable baseline in the design and the central systems. So it'll, it'll be the start of qualification will be driven by the end of that that SIT functional testing. So, so it'll depend on whether that's delayed or not. It's a soft dependency in a way. Yeah. Um, I would say not necessarily, but probably is the answer. I think that's the right answer. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. OK. I'm sure the questions aren't going to dry up that quickly. I guess what I, what I would say is that obviously uh, I'll, I'll come to Lee in a second. I was just going to say this is not materially that different from round three. So it's a by exception review that you're looking at. And, and therefore, hopefully a lot of this is some stuff you're familiar with 
already and, and that have been in the working groups you've picked up the conversations and uh, hopefully again you'll recognize this plan represents working groups and advisory group conversations that have been going on uh, so hopefully it won't be such a big uh, job to get across the documents of what they mean Lee yeah there's a question around qualification tranches so apparently the qualification tranches aren't aren't going to be confirmed until was it fe February 2024 and we should really bring that forward to, to now. So as part of the replanning is about getting more planning certainty for everybody involved and to not know within you know, a, a six month variable of which tranche you're going to be able to be within doesn't give enough planning certainty. So we really encourage bringing forward that date and use the use this replanning uh, as, as the vehicle to for participants to be able to request to be in a particular tranche. If people aren't bothered, that's fine. They can just take a kind of a, a lucky dip to it at the end but uh i know for, for edf you know we want to have more certainty around our plan and but, want to be able to uh, request to be in a particular tranche as part of this exercise but whether or not your plan suggests you'll be ready for tranche one for example um the progress of your delivery in reaching that point would need to be monitored and, and surely the scope of who's in which tranche that doesn't well, get planning search in terms of it saying saying oh wait and see how you get on and then we'll decide where you get doesn't give planning certainty and this whole replanning exercise is about you know giving more certainty to plans so well, we, yeah. we want to request to be in a, in tranche one uh, so we want to request to be in tranche one as part of this exercise uh, and not wait until 24 to to be able to get confirmation well, of that of course i can't speak for the code delivery bodies whose decision it is but I, I would have thought that there would need to be some more dynamic decision making about who's in which tranche than that. But again, I can't speak for them because they they own the process by which they're going to make those decisions. Yeah, can we, yeah. Can we do something to try and bring forward the, that, that decision making, the discussion around that then? Because it's a massive part of the plan of a six month variable. So it doesn't really help. I, th I think the best place to address that, Lee, is in the qualification working group off off the qualification approach and plan that's been um, sent out for review by the by the code bodies. So the we, we do have the you do have the opportunity to raise that. And we have the opportunity to discuss that in the QWG, and that oh, then the next QWG is next Wednesday. Yeah. So so that that is the best place to address that, because as Keith said, you know, it, it, it needs to feed into the qualification approach and plan that that approach to how the tranching works. Yeah, but from a, a replanning perspective that we, we also need to make sure from a, a central program perspective that there's a that we're helping participants to get more plan certainty. So your well, support in that would be welcomed as well. Yeah, and you can just waiting. You can state the assumption you're making uh, when you do your impact assessment. Oh, so yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. That, yeah, yeah. One, for example, um, yeah. that would be something we then raise as an uncertainty or risk that needs to be managed and mitigated. So we can monitor that, but it, although it's not our responsibility to make the decision, and we can certainly work with code bodies to ensure the risk is managed properly. Uh, yeah. And if there are a number of participants are saying, our assumption is we'll be ready for tranche one and we want to be in tranche one, then I think that would be good feedback at this stage. Yeah, we, we've done exactly yeah. that in the in the draft CR that we're working through. I'm sure. Yeah. So yeah, we're, we're, think, is somebody think, join, who's joining the QWG next week from uh, are you guys going to be on that, Jason or Keith? I'll, I'll be on it. Yeah. yeah okay. Um, it'll it'll be chaired by uh by by Nigel. I think Nigel's on the on the call. So there's <laughs> there's a there's a mix of sort of leadership and and responsible parties within the program as well as the code bodies and everyone else. Yeah. So the, the, so other yeah. Point I'll, the other point I'll raise in QWG as well is around this two month period for, for getting kind of a qualification approval from PAB and just trying to understand that timeline because again this yeah. we need greater certainty around you know what, what that period what that timeline looks like and to, to, to reduce the risk of uh, not getting through in two months. Well as Jason the approach and plan that's out there should really be answering these kinds of questions yeah. would, and the it's the, the, yeah it's just the association with the replan as well the reason yeah. we're raising it here yeah well yeah I, I certainly as a principle uh we do not for not, not only do we want everybody to reply to cr uh, 22 with their impact assessment but we want you to be very clear about the assumptions you're making because of course there are still uncertainties 
Uh, yeah. Unless we know the assumptions that you're basing your impact assessment on, we can't really judge it. Um, so, and again, we want to represent that PSG transparently as well. So that's definitely something that would, in the context of which path you take and how you get to migration, you need to know both halves of, halves of the equation, don't you? Okay. Thank you, Lee. At, at this point, Lee, two months was the best estimate we could put into the plan for going through the sign off through the, the PABs and and to give you time to mobilize your production environments in advance of 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 going into migration as well so so again you know if if there is the opportunity to bring that timing forward um on the basis of revised assumptions then then through the qualification approach and plan that's the place to discuss it we, we could be looking at circa kind of 800k a month run rate at that point in time so uh, every month really counts doesn't it try and uh, reduce the cost of delivery I think yeah. So, so I don't think we will. I don't think the intent is to artificially hold people out to that two months. If you're ready to go earlier, you'll be able to go earlier. It's just a reasonable yeah, yeah. planning assumption at the moment. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll go through it. QWG. Thanks, Sam. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Great. Chris. Uh, maybe another one for QWG. Um, but there's still an outstanding question around qualification from a uh, SEC point of view, um, and how that will work because uh, it's not part of the qualification approach and plan that's been sent out from QWG. So I don't know whether, Jason, you've got any further outlook on that or again, if we raise that at QWG. Yeah, we can raise it to QWG. Um, we are talking to DCC and SECAS around um, around around the SEC uh, part of it. Um, the only element for for SEC is is the MDR element of smart data services. Um, our current assumption is that um, smart data service providers who wish to use MDR will have completed UEPT with with DCC in advance of coming into SIT. But we do need to do some more work to understand um exactly what the dependencies are and and how that fits in between cit and sit functional etc so there is more work to do on that chris but that is the the, the assumption at the moment okay uh, yeah i mean if we can get a bit more information because i think apart from the new participant entrance process that was walked through at the dcc conference we haven't had anything from a current service user perspective so if you as a large supplier you're going to continue to use your current process yeah. what what's the what's the lead time on that um and and what do we need to do in terms of qualification for that because that will potentially impact timelines if it's a long lead time yeah my other question was about just an admin question really so the the other consultations have obviously been done through a consultation process with consultation questions etc this is a CR and therefore is slightly different in terms of the feedback mechanism. Are we just to fill in the CR with the assumptions that you've talked about and any other risks, issues, uh, comments in, in each of the specific areas or are you looking for something additional to that? No, I think the form was set out to allow you to uh, to put the information in the relevant sections so I, I, it would be best if it was all in that document yeah. uh load it up put as much as you want in there uh it's all great information for us um yeah so the, the more you can give us a, a, a basis for your impact assessment the better but yes it's just the form yeah okay we, we tried to automate it per round three but it actually got quite complicated um and we felt that actually it would constrain your ability to do that um and therefore a good old school approach probably was the best way of doing it Okay, great. Okay, any more for any more? Um, we do have a drop-in session next week, which we'll keep open for the allotted periods. So people can just come in and out if they've got questions that they think about subsequent to this. Um, you can ask for bilaterals if you want to talk about anything relating to the plan or impact assessment in more detail, or you can email the, uh, the, the PMO as well and we'll get back to you so there's a range of different ways you can still engage with us if you don't want to ask your questions here but we just felt it would be good to you know do a quick uh, top down on the plan and make sure that everybody understands what we've been trying to do uh, and what this represents at this stage 
Okay, if there are no more questions, no last orders uh, before we close the call. Uh, thank you for your time. It's great to see so many people on the call. Um, and do let us know um, before or even on the 26th if you've got any further help you need in, in getting back to us with your uh, CR22 replies. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Thank you.